He was one of the most obnoxious attorneys I ever encountered, ever. And what did he do for me to reach that conclusion? Come join me for a walk through the neighborhood as I share with you exactly what he did. Hi, I'm Jerry Oginski. I'm a New York medical malpractice and personal injury attorney. All right, I'm going on a walk today and I have a few minutes to share with you. I'm here with Daisy. It's her birthday today. She's seven. And I have Bentley over here. All right, he's nine. So now, let me tell you what happened. This was a medical malpractice case. And this happened early on in my career where the rules for depositions were not clearly defined. And when I say rules, I mean nowadays there are different rules. Why? Because of the exact scenario that I'm going to describe for you that occurred in this deposition. So now, in this deposition, I'm questioning a doctor in a medical malpractice case. The lawyer who represents the doctor is an old school, old time, senior trial attorney in a defense firm. And now apparently this attorney didn't believe that the rules applied to him, really any of the rules. Every single time I asked a question, this attorney not just would make an objection, but he would go on this long-winded rant that we call speaking objections. And being early in my career, I didn't really understand what he was trying to do or what the purpose of his arguing with me was over every single question. And was it frustrating? Absolutely. Now, there's something you should know. An attorney who represents an opposing witness, so in this case, the doctor's attorney, if they feel that my questions are inappropriate, they have every legal right to go ahead and raise an objection. In that instance, they have to briefly tell me what the objection is, what they think the problem is with my question or the topic, and now we can have a brief discussion about it, or I can simply move on and ask about different topics and different questions. What I didn't understand then, which I clearly understood afterwards was, this attorney was doing this primarily for two reasons. He was trying to give me a hard time, number one, because he thought and knew full well that I was an inexperienced attorney. Number two, he wanted to show the doctor whom he represented that he wasn't just going to sit there and roll over and allow me to ask whatever questions I wanted to. He wanted to make a big show. He wanted to let his client know that he was getting his money's worth, that he was there to do a job. And what was the job for him back then? His job was to make my life miserable. That's what his job was. Not to really object over anything significant because there were no significant objections. But at that time, because I was relatively young and inexperienced, I didn't know how to attack his attack. I didn't know how to counterattack. I didn't know what strategies I could use to really push back against what he was trying to do. And it was very frustrating for me. Not only was he doing this intentionally, but he was doing it to throw me off track so I would lose my train of thought. And you know what? He was successful doing that. Because although I had notes about what questions and topics I wanted to ask about, which I ultimately did, I kept getting thrown off track because now every time he raised an objection, which was about every 10 seconds, now he and I went back and forth and had long-winded arguments. Now, there's something else you should know about these depositions. A deposition is a question and answer session given under oath. Now, in pre-COVID times, it would take place in your attorney's office or in our office. In addition to the witness being there and his attorney and me being there, there will also be a court stenographer there to record all of the questions I'm asking and all of the answers that the witness gives. And the answers that the witness gives represents his sworn testimony and, you may not know this, but it carries the same exact weight as if he is testifying in court in front of a judge and in front of a jury at trial. So don't think for a second that because this pre-trial questioning takes place somewhat informally in an attorney's office or in a Zoom video call, that it doesn't have much significance. In fact, just the opposite. So getting back to this experience, this miserable experience that I had, I couldn't figure out a way to go ahead and get around this guy throwing up these constant obstacles by yelling out objections. He would argue with me for absolutely no reason whatsoever. He would make a big show to his client and laugh about it. And it was basically, ha ha ha, look, this attorney Oginski doesn't know what the hell he's doing. And there's no reason for my client to be answering that type of question. And although I'm trying to figure out in my mind what I can do, to try and get around this nonsense, the frustration level is rising. Steam is coming out of my ears and I'm doing everything possible not to retaliate in some fashion by verbally exchanging, getting to verbal arguments with him. But he drew me in over and over and over again. So in that regard, he was quite successful. 
And why do I say that this was a frustrating experience? Because it was so difficult for me to stick to the issues in the case because he kept arguing with me about absolute nonsense. There was a phrase he used that I still remember this till this day. You know, I'm in practice now almost 36 years. And the phrase was, you better gird for battle, Ojinski. I'm going to gird my loins. You better gird your loins because we're going to battle. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You know, it sounded like some old 1940 football film where now the opposing teams are ready for battle and now they're pulling out their armor and they're telling me to gird my loins. Like, oh my God, what are you, where are you coming from? This was the most bizarre deposition I ever had. And then when I got back to my office, I talked to some other attorneys. And it turns out that I did have some options that I didn't really understand. One of the options would have been to bust the deposition, to put on the record, to articulate on the record, how nasty and obnoxious and condescending this lawyer was. That was one thing. And then I could have asked the court in a separate written motion for sanctions and fines to be levied upon this attorney. This type of outrageous behavior never, ever should be endured by anybody. And it was just not humiliating, but just very, very obnoxious and frustrating. And I can imagine looking back on it now, how frustrating it must have been for his client as well. Although I'm sure the attorney thought he was doing a great job busting my chops simply because he wanted to and he could, and he did. You know, this would go on quite often, and it reached a point many years later where the courts, the administrative courts in New York, finally got so fed up with hearing so many complaints from witnesses who participated in depositions, from lawyers who were subjected to these nasty and obnoxious attorneys who were not acting professionally, who were not treating the people in the deposition properly and professionally, to the point where the court administration actually generated rules governing attorney conduct during the course of depositions. You would think that attorneys would have a common understanding of what's going on during a deposition. And you would think that they would know how to behave and what could happen to them if they don't. Well, unfortunately, after many, many years of this type of nonsense, finally it reached the point where the courts actually created this rule, multiple rules, that govern attorney behavior. And the bottom line is, it is for the benefit of the clients, it's for the benefit of the witnesses, of the court reporter, and the attorneys. Because the attorneys, actually the ones who are being subjected to this nonsense, are, are frustrated and they're not accomplishing what they need to. So, what happens if an attorney nowadays goes ahead and pulls that type of nonsense? Well, a couple of things. Usually, one of the attorneys will reach out to the court and ask for an immediate ruling. That doesn't always work because the judge may not always be available and may not be available or be willing to listen to the details that occurred over the past half an hour, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, three hours that have gone on during the course of this deposition. Alternatively, we can now take that transcript and now ask the court to impose sanctions on the attorney for bad behavior. And now we can have details of exactly what occurred. The court will now review it, recognize that there were clear violations of the attorney conduct code that occurs during depositions. And guess what? That attorney can be fined and sanctioned. And that is not a pleasant position for an attorney to be in by any means. So does it happen much today? Now, it doesn't happen very much today, but many, many years ago, I can tell you without a doubt, it most certainly did. So why do I share this quick information with you? I share it with you because I have a few minutes while I'm out walking Daisy. I gave her an early birthday present, which was I gave her dinner early. I gave her a couple of extra treats. And I wanted to open your eyes to help you understand how these types of cases work here in the state of New York. You know, I recognize you likely have questions or concerns about your own matter. If your matter happened here in the state of New York and you're thinking about bringing a lawsuit, but haven't done so yet because you have questions or concerns about your own matter, what I invite you to do is pick up the phone and call me. You know I answer questions like yours every single day and I'd love to chat with you. You can reach me at 516-487-8207 or by email at jerry, G-E-R-R-Y, at oginski-law.com. That's it for today's video. I'm Jerry Oginski. Have a fantastic day.